and to do what he was looking for. So uh, another guy there that I, I've known for a couple of years now, uh, he went out and did it. He said it was it was no, no big deal. Cool. Uh, All right, streams up. Okay. So. Take this. Is it on the same? Um, no, no, no. It's not this time. Um, I'll, I'll share it back to you guys the way I did the private one. Oh, I, I just went through your, um, your account. I, that works then, I guess. Um, and it sounds like there's audio going on too. There is, yeah. All right. Well, then for you. Sure how good it's picking up, but it is audio. <laughs> Um, maybe I need to turn the volume on my phone down just a bit. So, all right. Well, we're live. Uh, looks like I got four viewers, which will be you two, myself, and probably one other person. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, live stream. I've got uh, my buddies Tom Butts and uh, Michael Kidd, uh, fellow astrophotographers, uh, helping me out with this project because Michael just bought one of these, which is a uh, on-axis guider. It's different from an off-axis guider. And Tom is actually in the market for one. So I've got it. Michael still needs to install his, and Tom is probably going to be buying one um, at some point. So we figured we would just do this live stream to kind of familiar every, uh, familiarize ourselves and then you know this will be an archive uh, for them when they actually go to do the installations themselves or purchase it later but uh, I've shown you the on axis guider <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is show the off axis guider maybe talk about some of the problems that I'm solving So this, for those who are uninitiated, is an off-axis guider. And uh, telescope light comes in this way, or like this. And I don't know how well this is going to show, but there's a little mirror right here. And uh, it takes a little bit of that light and it bounces it up here, which is another camera. And that watches a star that gets picked off by this. And if the star starts to wiggle around or move too much, it can send commands back to my telescope over here. And those commands will help that telescope recenter the star where we want it to. And that's how I get um, the ability to take long, very long exposure photos of night sky objects and keep everything pixel perfect still for long periods of time. The problem that I've encountered, not everybody has this problem. This is common but not widespread is this pickoff prism here only sees just the tiniest little section of the night sky and the sensor inside is also incredibly small so not only am i picking off a tiny bit of the sky but i can only photograph an even smaller portion of that sky with this so my selection of stars is next to non-existent and sometimes when i go to photograph an object there's no stars to track and so the software throws an error and it shuts the whole sequence down the telescope goes back into its default position here and i lose basically an entire night's worth of imaging so to solve that these on axis guiders work a little differently they use a mirror that works the way that the uh, police one-way mirrors work where light gets bounced most ways, uh, or most light gets bounced in one direction, but some light's allowed to pass through, and so two cameras can see the same field of view, and if I've got a hundred stars that I'm photographing, my guiding software can pick from those same hundred stars, and I don't have to worry about a small little sliver of sky on a small sensor. So what we're going to do during this phone call with my friends and this live stream is install the on-axis guider and make sure all of the spacing is correct because both cameras have to be the same distance away from my focus or draw tube which is right here because they're going to have to be at the same focal distance so we're going to test the spacing that michael and i calculated earlier today 
and uh, we'll test it out on the moon, which is uh, in a really good position of the sky right now. So once we get this put on, we'll slew to the moon and see what's going on there. So why don't we get to it? Um, let's see. So we got the guide port, which is back here. And that's going to use this camera here, which is a uh, ASI-174 monochrome camera. And we decided that it doesn't need any additional spacing, so it just threads on direct to the rear of the on-axis guider. We also calculated that I need 15 millimeters, and I think that's what this is, of extension on this top port here for my imaging camera to sit on like this. Oh, I already pulled it out. So I'm going to double check that spacing. Guys, you're my eyes and ears here. Is this, uh, is this coming through okay? Is there any uh, delay, pixelation? Okay. Tom, it might just be your bad Wi-Fi. Tom, you know what? I had it set to 144. Yeah. There we go. That'll do it. So, what we calculated was 15 millimeter, and this is really hard to measure in one orientation, then flip your hands around and not drop anything. But let's try it this for the show should be able to see there that's 14 millimeter once the uh, buffering catches up to you guys yeah, for, uh, 14.98 I need 15 so close enough close enough for government work all right so I'm gonna take this extension tube and thread it onto the top like so and Michael you calculated you need the same 15 millimeters right and then the Moonlight Nightcrawler Rotator Focuser. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being exactly the same spacing after the focuser as you've got. All right. And now we're going to put that extension tube that we just did onto my camera. Actually, that's a lot less awkward this way. You know, now in hindsight, You'll want to put this on last because it's definitely a little awkward. So I would I would thread this uh, thread it together this way first and do your guider last. This this feels a little weird until it bites. Yeah, I was actually kind of thinking um, because the on axis guider uses those lock um, recessed screws of actually threading everything onto the the output of the focuser and then tighten those screws down and then build build from the telescope out when I put mine together, I think. So, this is the assembled system put together. Clearly, it doesn't thread in well enough that everything lines up exactly the way I want it to, but it's close. Um, and you can see this is skewed at that angle, but this is kind of skewed down at this angle, but I mean, it's close enough. I mean, I really torqued everything down, so it should be good and tight. And now I am seeing those gaps that you were talking about, Michael. Um, I'm going to just throw electrical tape over those. Um, if you got gappers tape, you could do that, but I, I'm just going to throw electrical tape on mine and seal those yeah, up. Um, if you need to adjust the rotation of your imaging uh, camera, you can loosen up the set screws that come in, there's three set screws, at least on the XM, I'm thinking there's probably three on yours as well. Uh, and then you can actually rotate that uh, output adapter in the uh, on-axis guider. I'm not seeing set screws, but I'm uh, gonna take it apart real quick and have a look. Okay. Yeah, mine are recessed uh, in quite a bit and it's a 1.5 millimeter Allen head. So uh, real fine 
wrench that you got to use to get in there. Torque this down so much. Oh, there we go. I don't see any here on the SC version. So. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a different interface then. Are your ports threaded on the SC? Yes, they're threaded. This oh, has the. Okay. Yeah, they are different then. Female threaded. And I can see that this neck is threaded into here. If I had a tool, I could probably. Because there's a couple of notches cut into this flange along the base here. If I had the right tool to go over the feed neck and go into these little recesses that are 180 degrees opposed, there's probably a special wrench that they made in shop yeah. that they can torque that on and off. But gotcha. That's how that's yeah, how on the SCs they're they're threaded in. Now this is a okay. used one. I don't know when it was made. The serial number is 1074, so I don't know what they're up to these days. Okay. Yeah, mine, um, the, the imaging port and the focuser input port, um, they're just square walls that go down into the on-axis guider. And there's three uh, recessed set screws that come into that area. So the adapter itself that goes out to the focuser or out to the imaging side has a, a V groove cut all the way around on the outside edge. And so you set it down in there and then screw those uh, set screws into place. So I, so I was unaware that SC was different. In the chat, uh, Garnet Larry says that uh, he would use something called a Verilock spacer. And that way you can quickly rotate. I've never heard of a Verilock. So I know what I'm putting on my Amazon wish list. Actually, I'll probably see if uh, OPT has any. And, I, have, I have a Bader very lock, and they're awesome. They're yeah. really cool. I use it. I use mine though to change um, spacing very precisely, and it, it works great. Then I think I think I, seen them. I think if I need to do that, um, you know, switching the camera orientation around, um, then that's the route I'm going to go with. Uh, is the Verilock. okay? So then I'm going to put the uh, the neck that goes into the focuser on. And I'm actually going to throw an additional length of spacer on here. I know that with this, it it fits in the focuser neck, and it doesn't really want to wobble around a whole lot. But I'm going to put even more on just to the more the better. That's that's my mentality right now. Yeah, I'm looking at that Bader right now on high point. It's, uh, it looks nice. Yeah, it's really nice, especially with the Rasa. Yeah. For, uh, if your spacing is critical, it really makes a difference. There we go. I'm going to step away just for a minute here. I got a neighbor asking to borrow a tool, so I'll be right back. Cool. See ya. There we go. That'll get me... So because I have to use compress a slip fit with compression rings, I want to have a lot of uh, extension tube going down that focuser's uh, internal diameter. So if the weight of all of this wants to kind of kick it one way or the other, or when I thread everything down to tighten that compression ring, if it wants to cause tilt, the yeah. more of this that goes down the throat of that focuser, the less it can actually tilt because this outer edge is going to collide with the inner diameter of that focus or draw tube. And this is going to get me 50 mil, 50 millimeter. That's so, good, yeah. I, and you said your compression ring doesn't come off, eh? Off from one leg? No, in fact, when I, when I run my finger on the inside of this focus or tube, it is one continuous piece of metal. So Interesting. I, I wonder if it's because they... Uh, they Manufactured different tubes based off the spec you originally get because mine for my pain, mine comes off. Um, I just was on their website to get the actual like dimensions of this entire focuser while we were working on the backspacing calculations to figure out 
you know, is this 15 millimeter going to be enough to match this? And will both be able to come to focus with the 254 millimeter back focus requirement of the telescope? And yeah. the CS model of the moonlight focusers, there's only one uh, draw tube. Um, oh, you have the CS. Yeah, I got the CS. Uh, I, I went cheap. Enough. I have the uh, L. CSL, I think it is. So does that give you a longer draw tube? I uh, I'm I think the CSL is just the larger diameter, isn't it? Is it isn't it CS two inches? CS is yeah. two. Yeah, so the CSL is two and a half. I'm back, by the way. We noticed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Who's stuck? Nope, that ain't going anywhere. That thing the draw tube wiggles because I got it fully extended, but the, uh, there's no tilt happening now. So I'm going to take the webcam. Sorry if anybody gets motion sickness here. And so this is how I've got it installed. We've got my focuser draw tube extended all the way out. The on axis guider is here. And the way that this works is the, again, the light from the telescope is going to come through the focuser near infrared light only passes through this mirror that's in here and this camera will detect it that's going to do the guiding all other non-infrared light hits this mirror bounces 90 degrees through my filter wheel and then into my imaging camera over here and that's what i'll use to take the pictures and they will see the same field of view so that's that's the goal i won't have to worry about losing stars when I do a meridian flip or not having a sufficient selection of stars when I start on a new target that I maybe have never imaged before. I won't have to worry about rotating the off-axis guider to find a star and make sure that 180 degrees from where it's positioned there will be another star waiting for it and hopefully that one's bright enough. Um, and then once I get that rotated and everything is where it's supposed to be, I would then, on the on -ax, off-axis guider, the original system, I uh, would then have to get the framing right for the imaging camera. There's just a whole pain in the butt. This, I just rotate the whole thing until I get it framed up the way that I want, and that's it. The whole thing. I don't have to rotate two. These little camera cases. Do you guys use these for storing like eyepieces or whatever? I've got two for eyepieces and I got one for all of my other like extension tubes. This is supposed to go in there. That's my caliper. Yes. So nice. Yeah, I've got one of those and then I've got a Pelican knockoff case for a lot of stuff too. Yeah, I, I used the Pelican Ask head cases. Yep. Yeah, I had a um, brick and mortar camera shop here in Dallas. Um, they were technically in Plano, which is the, the suburb I live in. Uh, they were going out of business. Uh, Amazon and B&H put them out of business. So uh, I went there when they were having a store closeout sale, and they had three of these left, and they were marked down to like five bucks each, so I bought them all. It was like, you're going to be my new eyepiece cases. <laughs> well, I got a pretty blue sky in the background on the uh, – I'm looking at the live stream – which is delayed a few minutes and it's uh it's starting to get dark let's see i yeah. can it's a nice contrast right now it yeah. looks nice and clear how's the scene today uh, i'm looking at sirius and it's got some twinkle to it so seeing is probably maybe two and a half out of five that, that, sh that should improve over the uh the evening though once the uh the temperature evens out you would not I mean, you would think so, but you got to understand the tropical jet stream is trying to cross Texas to bring spring to the rest of the country. And oh, we've just had area. three low pressure zones in five days come through this area. Our air is unsettled. Um, I mean, yeah, that doesn't help at all. No. So, you know, we just, we had tornadoes. Um, I know that there was at least one tornado warning in Carrollton um, and Louisville last night. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, you got Dallas on the east side, Fort Worth on the, uh, the west side, the whole Metroplex is about the size of the state of Connecticut. And, um, where I live is like in the extreme Northeastern corner, Louisville and Carrollton are like North central. And, um, 
so they were the the path of this cell that was tornado warned. I don't think there was a tornado on the ground, but uh, the path of that storm that was tornado warned. I could see the storm and the lightning from my house, but it was maybe 15, 20 miles from me. Um, and uh, there were a bunch of other tornadoes last night in and around the uh, the greater Metroplex area. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's that time of year. So I'm going to take any clear night we got. But in between storms, the weather, you know, the skies are never going to be good and calm. Uh, a few nights ago, I got lucky and I had real still skies and I did some um, moon photos, which I'm about halfway done processing. Um Michael, I'm going to have to send you what I got. Uh, Tom's seen them, and he kind of gives me some uh, some criticism on, you know, the uh, not bad criticism, just like constructive feedback. You know, saturation looks a little like you overcooked it. The contrast needs to adjustment or, you know, the luminance layer is sharp and that looks good. Okay. So I'll send you what I got when I get inside. They're on my uh, home PC. Um, yeah, no worries. Let's see, I got to about to turn this thing on and realized I haven't hooked up any of the cables just because we did all of that other stuff. We're not done yet. We're not out of the woods. I have all of this to plug in. Uh, it's more like three or four. So let's see. Filter wheel. Which one's the smaller one? It just looks so I, I'm sorry, I might have less risk of what? Uh, a peer collision. So if you're uh, getting close to your peer, you might have some more space with the imaging part up on top instead of down toward the peer or down toward the mount. No. Um, I mean, I get where you're going with that, but no, that's not a risk because from this angle, I can tell you that my Versa plate actually is closer to the peer than the bottom, uh, the uh, cooler end of that ASI 1600. Um, and the, uh, the slew limits that I've got on this thing are, um, they, they should, they should protect it. Okay. So, no and I've had plenty of peer collisions already in the past what, before I learned how to set those slew limits and do a proper Meridian flip and I've never damaged a camera. So, um, it should be, I should be good to go, but yeah. Okay. So, you have a, uh, some sort of peer collision protection does it cut out or it does um so the way that the uh the the tracking system the, the paramount here the way that that works is um the uh there's a voltage sensor inside of the uh, the motors and um as soon as it detects there's encoders in the motors and as the motors turn if the encoders send no motion it will attempt to increase the voltage a little bit because it could be, you know, an imbalance issue. But as soon as that slight voltage increase yields no more encoder movement, it shuts everything down. So you literally get like one encoder ticks worth of margin of error as far as that's how I understand it. Um, I'm sure a year from now, one of the BISC brothers that started the company is going to watch this video and be like, no, that's not how it works at all. But that's how I understood it. Um is uh, as soon as they detect that additional vo voltage yields no motion, it cuts power to the uh, RA motor and you stop. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see. So here in chat, I got this guy, Frank81, MNE2. He says he's in Allen, Texas, um, which is cool. Uh, so... I'm actually, if you're still here, Frank, um, I'm probably like just down the road from you um, in, cause I'm in uh, Northeast Plano, not too far from Allen. Um, Will Young's here, Deep Sky Dude, and Garnet Lee, Yuri bounced. So, oh, all right. While that's going, 
I'm going to flip into the remote computer for the time being. And uh, just an FYI, I looked at Innovations Foresight uh, website, mm -hmm. and the SD version is M42 on all three ports. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I was wrong. because I just threaded M42 on everything myself. So I am um, whatever age mine is, you know, a thousand ish seems like a low serial number. But then again, this isn't a widely known product. So I don't think it's a widely purchased product. Um, so who knows how many they've actually sold. I, this could be a relatively recent buy um, from the person I bought it from. It could be he had it for five years and he's selling it. And, um, you know, maybe he's going to the larger format. I don't know. I didn't ask. Didn't care. So, uh, let's see. I can close Sequence Generator Pro on the remote PC. Yeah, I don't care if there's gear connected. Oh, crap. I've been cooling my camera for, like, two days minus five. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope it still works. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Probably. What, what's going to fail on it's the fan. You know, I've had like spiders and stuff crawl into that thing and jam it up. And uh, it's always worked fine. Yeah, my uh, brand new on-axis Guider XM version is in the XM1100 range on the serial number. Okay. Uh, but I don't know if XM versus SC if there are different uh, different iterators on that, those different lines. Uh, if, if it were me doing it, and this is just because I'm a database guy, each table gets its own iterator. And so each product, Absolutely. you know, yeah. um, you know if, you're, if you're tracking each product in its own table, it gets its own iterator. Yep. I have no idea what you're talking about. I fly your planes. I'm a basic man. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is you have the harder job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Like anything else. Listen, if I crash a server, no one dies. If you crash a plane... It's probably harder to crash a plane than to crash a server. That's, I don't, yeah, probably. It takes a lot. Well... Yeah, I have a lower I have a lower risk job right now than, than you do, Tom. I mean... Oh, if there's risk involved, you're doing it wrong. The name of the game is to minimize risk. Right. Yeah, I, I do cloud uh, storage consulting and support for Red Hat. Uh, okay. So I, I help large scale providers not lose customer data. Right. I've been talking to Alan the past couple of weeks and I've been trying to teach myself uh, C. Okay. And my brain just doesn't, doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a very, very visual person. So have you tried Python first? Uh, I've done a little bit of Python years ago during college. Okay. But the uh, specific project I want to work on involves embedded systems. Mm -hmm. So I think, from what, what, I, what I remember, I think I need to learn C. I could be wrong. But... Yeah. Uh, there is a micro Python that runs on, like, the ESP32 and ESP8266. Okay. Um, but it's uh, it adds quite a bit of overhead. So... You lose some memory, um, you know. So depending on what you need to do, you may run out of space using it, and need, need to go back. That's, that's, and, and the thing about C is there's a lot of things that modern programmers take for granted, like, you know, deallocation of memory and garbage collection. And C is just like, if you're not using it, we're going to keep it there unless you tell yeah. it not to do. So memory leaks in C and other, um, I call them low-level programming languages, but I, the people who actually use low-level programming languages will argue that C is a high-level programming language. Um, but uh, yeah, they... Uh, 
those programming languages, you need to you need to be very explicit about what you're doing, when you're doing it, why you're doing it, it as far as the code is concerned. And uh, don't ever leave anything up to assumption. Yeah, for sure. So, all right, so I just got the mount connected, and we homed. Yep, so you dance in there on the live feed. Yeah, so what I'm going to try to do now, and you're going to get the Hall of Mirrors here, is uh, I'm going to switch to my display capture so we can watch the remote desktop session. Oh. There. So let me know when that flashes over for you guys and how it looks. It's probably going to be pixelated as hell because it's a remote session being piped through OBS and then out to YouTube. So, you know, at least two levels of compression, maybe three. Seems I was not live on my feed, so I just clicked the live button, and I, I do have that now. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do next. Yo, that looks good to me, Alan. Yeah, All yeah right. it looks pretty good. I'm going to fire up sharp cap, because I can do, I can just switch from one camera to the next. And while I'm in the Sky X... Talking about Plano, uh, that's where my wife had to have me in surgery. Uh, we were staying in that area. Uh, she got a dog bite that pierced the synovium on her middle finger Ow. and infected the synovium. So I had to have a hand surgeon fillet her finger open to. Uh, Flush out the infection. That was good times. Thanks. We're at in Plano. Uh, it was a corgi. Um, he just got um, he he got caught in uh, behind my chair, the captain's chair, in the motor coach while we were driving down the highway. Uh -huh. She reached in instinctively to try to free him, and um, he just felt this outside influence and turned and bit before he realized it was off. You know. Oh, so, yeah. instantly let go. It wasn't like he was... Yeah, he probably, he probably let go and it's like, I am so sorry. Yes, yes. My, uh, I've got two dachshunds, and uh, one of them will play rough. The other one, he's ten, he just turned... He's never bit anyone, not even me. Like, I tried to play rough and get him to kind of, like, you know, mouth my hand with it, you know, when we're playing and stuff like that, and he won't do it. But the other dog, he will... And he's not afraid to play, bite, and stuff like that if you're getting a little rough. There was one time he got a little carried away, and um, he nipped at me while we were playing. And he just got, like, the tiniest bit of my hand between the very front teeth. And um, actually kind of caused me to bleed, but when he did it, I pulled my hand away, and I was like, ow! And his tail went between his legs, his ears went back, he gave me the puppy dog eyes. He crawled up in my lap and snuggled up and tried to lick my face like, I'm so sorry, Dad. So, yeah, I get the whole, like, they realized um, their reaction may have been an overreaction. And honestly, you know, in, in, in your situation, Michael, or in my situation, I don't fault the dog. It was not, no, not their all. fault, right? Yeah. Um, yep. And yeah, so, you he know. Was in pain. He, he had his, uh, one of his nails caught in something, and it, it, he wasn't able to get free from it immediately. And so it was painful for him. And he just, you know, reacted out of instinct, not, not realizing. Uh, yeah. So oh, yeah, I don't definitely don't blame the, the dog at all. We have our first glitch. There is only one camera being detected, the 174. Huh. Oh, and I also remember. Let's see. Flashlight. So what's going on here? Oh. I plugged the uh, I plugged the sixteen hundred into itself. Oh. That'll that'll work. Yeah, the uh, USB input was going into the sixteen hundreds USB output, so it was infinite loop. Sweet. All right. Now we will rescan for cameras. In my earlier <laughs> days, I had a commander in the Navy tried to hook up his computer and he had the surgery plugged into itself and couldn't understand why things weren't coming on. <laughs> I 
I have two surge protectors in my home office that are doing that exact same thing. Um, just I, I use it for storage. Just for storage. Yeah. 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 I told him if he got that to work to let me know that we'd be rich. And until then, he's gonna have to plug it into the wall. He's who might even be watching because he follows me on YouTube. We used to work together. Shit, almost a decade ago, I think it was. Um, at a, a company that did title insurance. And uh, he had uh, one of those big APS battery backups plugged into itself. It was dead. Um, but yeah, he plugged it into itself. And, uh, you know, when I asked what was going on, he goes, I've discovered infinite energy. So, all right. So we got the 1600 found. We're going to connect to it. Okay. The stream is dropped out. Yeah, it, uh, I had a, Probably because I got um, where I was standing, probably got between the uh, receiver. Anyway, um, it said that it just reconnected. Um, yeah, good. Oops. Yep. So what I'm waiting on is the uh, remote desktop session, which stalled out on me to reconnect. So um, turn that display capture back on here. And try that. My ultra secure blank password. I mean, no one will guess it. I mean, somebody might just press enter, but I mean, if you're expecting to pre uh, type in a password, no one's going to guess it. All right, so Surprise there's... Surprise remote desktop will even let you connect without a password. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't able to with mine. Really? Yeah, I had uh, I tried, but I, when I tried connecting to my computer, if the user didn't have a password, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to connect. I had to uh, create a password. See, I've, I've had to set up Windows um, remote desktop uh, services and enable them on so many computers over the years. I think it's a, um, a way to allow, um, you have to set the user account up to be a passwordless user account on the Windows 10 device that you're connecting into. It's got to be Windows 10 Pro. Um, yeah. And then there's either a registry setting or something else. If I've got a if I've got any of my Windows 10 or Windows Server admin friends in the, the chat, they'll tell you. But there is there is a way that you can basically configure the remote desktop on the uh, remote end to... Um, and I, oh, God, I want to say it's in the group policy editor. Um, yeah, it might be. Everything is in there. Well, yeah. But, I mean, I think that that's the only... If, 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 if I'm remembering correctly now, I believe that's the only place... Like, there's... I don't think there is a registry hacker. Maybe you got to do something in the registry to enable it in the GP, uh, GPC, but um, yeah. All right. So where was I going? Oh, yes. Back here. Uh, the focuser should be connected. So we're going to run it out 500 steps. And hopefully that gets tighter. Looks a little better. Yeah. I can see the yellow coming in. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for too. <clears throat> Speed that up. Getting closer. How far in were you on the focuser? I rolled it, it all the way in. I rolled it a hundred percent in. Ah, uh, that explains it. Does the CDK come with with a uh, Optech or what focuser? Uh, it, it comes with a, what they call a Hendrick 
focuser. I think it's something that they make. Um, but that's it doesn't do rotation. It only does focus. Yep. Uh, so I bought a Moonlight Nightcrawler uh, three inch for it. Nice. Yep. It is a beast of a focuser. Yeah, the Nightcrawler is huge, eh? Yeah. I want a Nightcrawler. Okay, what, three, four, five pounds? Uh, yeah, I think like six pounds uh, for the Nightcrawler. Damn. Anyway. Okay, well then, I I would have to get a whole new... Well, no. Would I need a new extension tube or anything like that on the back? Or is it roughly... Uh, is It's it's only... It would probably replace... Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it would probably replace and go directly attached to the... Um, the rear cell? Yeah. And there may be a flange. I think they offer a 1.7 inch flange as well to extend it out a little bit, which is what I have on mine. Um, I have like 265 millimeters of back focus. Yours is actually pretty out there too, 254 millimeters mm -hmm. for an RC. Yeah, that's why I was asking because I think we're only with, we're we're within 20. All right, so oh yeah, and my my focus or draw tubes only extended out maybe a quarter to a third. So, uh, rephrase the question. Oh, um, 15. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I've got the moon in focus, which is great. Now I'm going to switch cameras to the 174, which is my guiding camera, and we should see a moon preferably close to focus and way overexposed. Yeah, uh, yeah in near infrared. Okay, so we're going to need to... We need to increase that exposure. I'm sitting here waiting with bated breath for the live stream to catch up. Oh, shit. Mine's showing live. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just... Oh, wow, yeah. Wow, that's bright. Yeah, it is. Or not. No, it it, 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 it kept the same exposure setting as the 1600, and then it auto-corrected um, auto itself down to, like, you know, a, a tenth of a millisecond. And so Man, now I've increased it. In perfect focus already. Yeah. yeah. That was by accident. Because I ran the focus, uh, the helical focuser on that on-axis guider 100% in. No, so. That's, that's by calculation. That was an accident. That was intentional. Yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, Michael. It looks like if if you you if you use the calculator you built for me because you couldn't get the other one to work on your setup, if you can get the numbers to reconcile, this is proof that I shouldn't say proof. This is evidence that it can work. Yep. Because you're only yeah, a couple. Yeah, going to be a little different because uh, you got the you have the 174 full size, right? Not the lipstick version. Correct. Yeah, see, mine's the lipstick version, uh, so it's a little different. I actually need to recess mine into the on-axis guider a little bit, um, and I'm going to use a slip ring, uh, M42 slip ring adapter, so like if I were putting an eyepiece instead of the uh -huh. guide camera, and that way I'll be able to slide it in and then adjust the focuser to bring it back out. But it's not far. All right, let's find a target. Something narrow band because we got what like a eighty six percent full moon. Let's see. Yeah, it's looking pretty full. Eighty nine. So it's eighty nine point nine five. So it's a ninety percent full moon. So we need a narrow band target. Um, we're gonna do quick this time of year. M forty two actually. Try the horse head. Horse head. A little bit higher. All right. Yeah, horse head or flame, both of those are good narrow bands. Rosette, rosette would be nice and high too. Oh, oh, relatively high. Rosette. I have not done the rosette through this RC yet. All right, so now that I got it found, we're going to center on it. Zoom in a bit. I'm also honestly surprised at how much IR there is on the moon. I thought it would be good, but I didn't think it'd be that good.
All right, so tracking may not be dead on perfect, but, you know, we've got an auto-guider for that. But um, I'll need to redo my T-point because I'm sure that the balance and the weight and everything like that is going to mess with the differential flexure, or not the differential flexure, the uh, the tube flexure and the mount flexure. How many points do you uh, usually do? See, I don't have to remember that answer because I can just go in here and tell you what I did the last time. Two hundred sixteen. Wow. And I wound up with a Sky RMS of seven point three two and a PSD the point spread distribution of seven point seven two after the supermodel, which I've heard anything under ten is pretty good. So, um, I'll take that. Yeah, that, that looks a lot like uh, what EPCC does um, with the, uh, pow they call it APPM, Astrophysics Point Model. All right, so this ain't going to work anymore. I mean, it could, but we're not going to use it for anything. And we're going to switch to PhD, multi-star guiding. Connect to two. Let's make sure it's this one seventy four. Sky X connect. connect. So are you going to be using PhD or the Sky Guide for this? PhD to start, and then I will go to Sky Guide uh, once the weather in Texas will give me what I anticipate to be enough clear nights to justify the 60 day trial. Cause the last time I did a 60 day trial was on sequence generator pro right yeah. after I got the paramount and it rained for six months. <laughs> so I'm going to wait until like, sounds like my luck. Yeah. I'm going to wait till June. And, um, in June, what I'll do is, uh, you know, once I know how to make everything work with PhD, um, which shouldn't take more than maybe tonight or tomorrow night at the, at the least. Um, Let's go ahead and at least get this thing going. Looping. See what it can find in a three and a half second sub. That ain't right. How in the hell was I so in focus on the, on the moon? Yeah, the moon's pretty far in off, off of infinity. There you go. Oh. Yeah. You got some good donuts. Yeah. You're pretty, pretty close. Like the moon did look a little bit soft. Well, here's the neat thing. I'm really close to the telescope now that it's slewed to this side of the pier. So there. You might uh once you get it close, use SGP to get focus on the imaging camera and then switch SGP over to the guide camera and uh, just run a loop frame and, and focus the guide camera in then. And that's a big field of view for the uh, your guider. Uh -huh. yeah, it is. I'm used to using the middle third. Yeah, I'm really eager to get this online. It just feels like I got a long way to go before them stars start to tighten up. Do you have your um, the XY axis plate for your guide output? Do you have that centered? Yeah, I used the moon when I, I looked through it, and that's when I decided, okay. hey, the moon might actually work. Um, and... I'm not worried about the donuts being oblong. I've heard that this in act intentionally introduces astigmatism. Right. Yes, you're correct. So I was just trying to compensate that in my head. Like, why, why are they not round? But yes, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I guess the way that the uh, uh, um, sky guard works is its focus system measures that astigmatism. Yep. And uh, that's how it determines where you are. Um, in focus, and it uh, will 
play with that astigmatism. You can actually map an astigmatism value to a focus point on a given filter. So when you switch filters, I guess it knows, hey, these stigmatism values need to be this. Yeah, I'm wow. super excited about that. Continuous live autofocus. Uh-huh. That's going to save. Do you have the same mode. version as uh, Alan, Mike? Like the uh, M42 version? I know there's, uh, a no. there's a larger one, yeah. This one is the, uh, the XM, where uh, the one he's got is the SC, and the XM allows for up to a 50 millimeter diagonal chip. Yeah, fair enough. All right, I think I've passed focus. There's maybe not. Are you adjusting? Oh, you're adjusting the helical focuser by hand? Yeah. Okay. Have you focused the imaging camera yet on the stars? Uh, No, I have not. Uh, just on I the moon. Do that. Yeah, I would do that first. Yeah, because you, you'll probably have to readjust the... Yeah. yeah, but I'm thinking I'm close. All right, so now with that, close enough. Let's, I just want to see if it'll find stars. Oh, yeah, the stream is catching up now for me, so, yeah, that's... Yeah, it's got like eight or so. Force of calibration. It also makes sense. Your astigmatism is diagonal. And if I remember correctly, your guide camera, when it threaded on, it stopped at kind of a diagonal position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's awesome. All right, so while this is doing the calibration, I'm going to switch over to stream and see if I get any questions in there. So Ernie Jacobs, yeah, I think he's he's saying Rosette for sure. We got nine people in the stream. Um, so for those of you who are here or still here or, you know, have been here since the beginning, you know, thanks for watching. I hope, um, you know, this, uh, this neat piece of equipment that I got, the on-axis guider, um, if you haven't heard of it before, like Garrett Leary was saying earlier, um, this would be uh, this would be kind of a game changer for us. They're they're a little on the pricey side, but for what they can do, I think it's worth every penny. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, I spent almost three hundred dollars on that Celestron off-axis guider, and when it works, it's great. But because of my limited field of view, and Michael, your CDK probably has an even more narrow field of view. Yep. Um, off axis guiding, I mean, you got to plan that pickoff prism position adequately, but you're using a moonlight, so you can rotate that if you need to, right? Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. I've actually been pretty lucky. Um, I use the rotator more for framing my capture than I do for looking for guide stars. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've been pretty lucky so far. <laughs> See, I, I have to, I have to come out here. Like, I, the, the once everything is on and I'm on target, it's all automated. But to get it there, it's all manual. Like I have to come out here and roll the roof off. I have to rotate the camera to where I want it. I can't touch it for days while I'm working on a on a um, target. And I have to either accept that framing for all targets or just stick to one target for that framing. And then once it's done, switch the framing by rotating the camera however I want it rotated to do the next target. Um, and you know, that's kind of a bitch, but I've just learned oh, to, yeah. however it lands on the sensor, that's how it's going to look when I, you know, when it's done. <laughs> Rotate it in post. Yeah. yeah Make a big moonlight. enough mosaic and you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. The night crawler really makes it handy. It's, it, ha it's some crazy amount of steps for a full rotation. Um, like I'll have to look it up cause it's really absurd, but I don't want to say the wrong number and mm -hmm. artificially inflate it. Um, but it's so precise that if I wanted to uh, even not shoot flats on multiple targets at different rotations in the same night, I could just re-rotate it later um, to the same exact step, and it would be spot on. Wow. 
little bit jealous. <laughs> Don't be. It, it really lightened my pocketbook quite a bit. Oh, I, get, I bet. Oh, I see my dog. Okay, so, yeah. Crazy amount. 444,080 steps for a full revolution. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> so it can be super precise. So it looks like it's 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 moving around a little bit, but I'm sure once I get everything focused a little bit better, and it looked like my connection may have dropped for a second, so yeah, it did just for a second. Because um, my remote session all of a sudden like popped on me, so I'm thinking I lost connection to the home network briefly. Um, anyway, um, it looks like the centroid on the star it chose might be drifting around a little bit. But the centroid on all of the multi-stars might be holding still. We'll see what it does over time. I would think um, once you get it like in pinpoint focus, I would think that astigmatism would go down to almost nothing. You would hope. You would hope. That, I mean, that's um, Gaston did a demo on the Astro Imaging channel, and that's really what it, it did for him. Of course, it was all on a bench in perfect conditions. But um, well, I mean, yeah, and you also might want to limit, like, lower your uh, search region in PhD2, right? Your, your search region currently looks pretty big. So it's covering that entire, like, there's two centroids I'm seeing. Uh huh. Kind and of might, you, might have, you might have the risk of jumping between centroids if it if all of it in the search region. There it is, eight pixels. It's, it's only eight, eight. It looks bigger on the screen, but. I guess seven is down pretty nicely, eh? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that guiding's looking good. Uh, total RMS right now is uh, 0.98. Oh, it's. I haven't changed the um. I haven't changed the camera parameters. I think. Ah, um, oh, okay. He's in here with me. Yeah, pixels. Oh, it got the pixel size. It, oh, yeah, it's it gets that from the S one. It gets that from the ASCOM driver, I guess. Yeah. All right. We'll get rid of... Well, no, because you were using off-axis before. I was going to say, do you need to adjust the focal length? But it's going to be the same. It should be the same. <coughs> oh, not that. That icon. thinking it's time to play oh really yeah she's over here talking to me my dog's cocking his head funny when that thing runs the uh i love the sound of that focuser yeah it's annoying to me really maybe it sounds different in person no it probably sounds exactly the way you think it sounds <laughs> Just sounds like precision is really what I'm getting to. <laughs> and it, it is. Um, um, Tim Shu built it for me. Oh, okay. So you're you. Okay, yeah. So you're using a, a different motor on the CS2 then. It's not the motor that uh, Moonlight ships. No, no, no. This this motor is big. Um, it's like three or four inches long. It has oh, a. Wow. It's got a gear reduction box, so it's high torque. Um, yeah. He gave me a smaller motor at one point uh, when he first built it, and it did not have enough torque to move the moonlight, as or not the moonlight, um, the stock focuser that came with it. Um, and so I went with the moonlight, thinking that would solve the problem, because we figured it was um, just a poor, a, you know, the, the focuser was a poor yeah. focuser, right? A little stiction in there. Uh. We, well, actually, we couldn't get enough friction, and it was slipping. Well, we, oh, yeah. So, 
we I went with the moonlight, and then it couldn't move the moonlight. So the not enough friction. It was uh, the small motor was able to rotate freely. Um, yeah. but then you get the uh, properly built focus or like a moonlight and we put that motor on and it couldn't lift the camera with the off-axis guider so he uh, he built a new controller that could handle this different motor and uh, then gave me this uh, high torque motor and it's it's got a ton of steps for one revolution and we also changed the gearing for the belt and uh, all right, so we are now in focus. HFR is 2.82. We'll go back to PhD. And of course, it lost the guide star. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Shift and focus around like that. Um, but we'll keep looping PhD. <laughs> What I might do is change that from three and a half second down to a half second. Okay. You know, I usually set mine to auto. I don't. Your, uh, your duration? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I set mine usually between four and six seconds. But my seeing isn't great. Yeah, see, mine looks grainy like that all the time. I think my guide uh, camera is out of focus to the uh, imaging camera on my right now. Yeah, see these little uh, these little kidney beans, or not kidney beans, but you know, little bean-shaped stars are getting a little tighter. Mm -hmm. You're tweaking the manual focus now. Yeah. You know, they're not changing shape too much. I wonder if I hit the end of uh, travel. I wonder if maybe later I'll play with that by throwing a uh, maybe a 5 millimeter extension tube. You, you have a reducer on right now, right? No, I can't do this with a reducer. Um, oh, the re really? Okay. Yeah, so the reducer, the, the astrophysics reducer, has got 85 millimeters of back focus requirement. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the guide ports on this off-axis guider, on-axis guider, sorry. The uh, the ports on the on-axis guider are both beyond, uh, well, no, the guider port is beyond that. The image report is at 66 mil, which only gives me, what, 19 millimeters of um, play? Well, the focus wheel is 17 mils thick. I, it's, I, I, I'd be too far, um, too far back. Now, I could probably make that work, and I could probably get it to focus and everything, but I'm going to probably introduce vignetting if I have too much reduction. Yeah. So, all right. Let's redo guiding. Hopefully it locks onto some new stars. If not, a single star would probably be fine. Up that to, say, five second subs. Try uh, try clearing your eye graph there so we can get an accurate direction of how the guiding is doing. There. All right, so that's all cleared out. Um, start guiding. <clears throat> and I lost connection. Did I lose connection? 
Yeah, shit. It's buffering. It says excellent connection strength on the YouTube side. Huh, interesting. Oh, it came back now. Yeah, it's back. Yeah. It went down for a few seconds. Okay. All right. So we're going to Sequence Generator Pro, and why don't I just close that and get rid of the autofocus? Um, actually, go to HA, set. I'm going to need to refocus. I'm going to need to pause guiding. Four, four, it looks pretty good. What was that now? Point four four. Yeah, I think I think that's why I saw it in the last uh, last time we brought up the screen. Um, uh, total is point five two. Might might be a bit of a lie. Looks like you have the y axis at what is it 16? Drop that thing down to four. Oh, no, I like, I like watching a I like watching a smooth graph. I know, I know, it looks better that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at it like holy crap, mine never looks that flat. Oh, he's, he's in easy mode, that's why. Yeah, right, yeah, cheater mode. It's, it's a yeah, cheater mode. Yeah, if it were doom, it'd be daddy, don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Trevor Jones does to make his guiding look so good. Is he goes to sixteen arc seconds on his guide charts? <laughs> nice. I will say those stars are looking much more round right now, but it's because SGP is out of focus. Well, and I also paused the loop, so you're seeing the last, oh. the last out of focus image. Gotcha. And SGP is cratering the, the focus. It'll eventually work itself out. Yeah. There we go. It's starting to, it's starting to go back out. <sighs> coyotes are... Coyotes in the uh, park next to me are calling. I was wondering, I heard something earlier, and I couldn't tell if it was on my end or your end, but for some reason it sounded like a cat with a hairball, so I was looking around at my two cats to see where they were. Oh, uh, it could be the folding chair scraping on my deck. Ah, that could be. Luckily, both of my cats were in easy vision, and they were both sound asleep, so no urgent issues on my end. All right, let's see how the stars look with the HA in focus. That'll work. Begin guiding. And we can close this. And we'll go ahead and rip off a, uh, say, a 300 second sub. Just do a test exposure. Well, that's going. I'll see if I get any questions in chat. In fact, um, if anybody's still watching, um, you know, now would be a good time because I can actually monitor chat and see what you guys are asking. Um, yeah, we got eight lost, I mean, lucky souls out there still. I'm showing seven, oh, but it could be eight. Us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and chat's been pretty quiet. Um, so... This is, uh, for those of you who don't know, when, when somebody's streaming on YouTube, this is what we see. This is, this is the backside of YouTube. Um, so we've got the uh, stream settings, which I won't go into because it has all of like the personal information to start a stream on my account. If you have my, also my user ID and password, but I've got like viewer activity, stream health, um, and then the analytics, which basically just gives me the 
the graph of who's been watching for how long. We can see how many total playbacks we've had. So we've had an estimated 96 people in and out. There's currently eight still here. The average watch time is six minutes and 10 seconds. Although I'm sure that the bulk of that average is coming from like you two and, uh, you know, Gar uh, Garnet was in here for a while. So, um, I don't know who else we've still got. The numbers. Yeah. So, anyway, um, again, if anybody's still watching and, and you're actively watching, not just like letting it run in the background while you do the dishes, um, you know, we got a couple of minutes before this first test exposure of the Rosette Nebula downloads. Um, if you got questions about what we're doing, um, ask away. What equipment I'm using, ask. Um, it's not just me. I've got uh, Tom Butts and Michael Kidd on here. Um, they're uh, Facebook friends of mine. Um, they're in a lot of different Facebook groups. Uh, Michael's got a website, Turtle Herding. Yep. Yeah. Turtleherding.com. Turtleherding.com, yeah. where he does a little bit of uh, astrophotography and I think a little bit of Linux as well on that website. Um, yeah. It, it's. I'm taking over the travel blog. Uh, usually when we're out on the road, mm. uh, I have live streams while we're driving down the highway. My wife and I are mic'd. And, um, I live streamed uh, the conjunction back in December. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Occasionally. I did that too, but I was able to do it from the comfort of my uh, home office all three nights. Uh, me too, because I was using my observatory in New Mexico. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Unlike me... Uh, you don't have houses to contend with. I had a roof line I had to watch out for. So I only right. got, I think I got around uh, 45 minutes to an hour each night that I did it. That sounds about like what I got, maybe an hour and a half mm -hmm. uh, before it would drop below the horizon. But I, I tracked it all the way to the mountaintops uh, until it started disappearing. Uh, your, your benefit is uh, you're there close and could switch out to a one-shot color if you have one. Um, I had to stick with my mono camera from for my processing for that. Right. Um, yeah, I was using my DSLR and uh, just oh, nice. Yeah, ran out. Uh, Backyard EOS was my uh, capture yeah. software for that, and I just went right into frame and focus, focused everything um, with the uh, the controls because it it um, Backyard EOS now has a uh, well, it didn't when I first started using it, but now it's got ASCOM focus control, so that's cool. Um, oh, very nice. And so I was able to dial in the uh, the uh, my moonlight focuser with the uh, um, uh, DSLR uh, thrown on the back there, and uh, I ripped a couple of uh, captures and then uh, stacked them. They didn't turn out as impressive as I was hoping for. I also have not really thrown a lot of effort into processing them, but uh, yeah, I was able to like I had it framed perfect. Like I got it, it all worked out. It was Jupiter and Saturn. Um, nestled in the corners i got the camera rotation just right and uh yeah i started streaming the planets before the sun went down because you know they're daytime planets you can see them in the daytime oh yeah um and yeah with the rc and that uh that dslr um i don't think i had to use the focal reducer for that i think i went you know just straight um native focal length and it worked it was it was i was shocked it worked out so well yeah I, I was pretty uh, pretty stoked as well. I, I had um, everything in one frame, uh, even with the 12.5 CDK, so I was really happy with that. And I was shooting uh, ZWO 1600, uh, like you're shooting with tonight. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy to have that all oh, in one oh, field of view. That looks... I, you know, I did some captures that night too. I haven't even looked at so I, I probably should go and see if I can monkey with those a bit. So that's... Yeah, that's the frame. Well, this is a question, eh, from Frank. How do you guys like the SGP autofocus? Oh, um... For me, I, I personally like it. It takes a little bit to get it set up in terms of your step size. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, I find it works really well. What do you guys think? Yeah, I've had similar experience. Um, step size is definitely the key. And then how many steps you want to use to achieve focus. Yeah, uh, like that, how many that, measurement intervals. Yeah. And that really depends on what type of telescope you're using. If you're using uh, something with a uh, central obstruction, 
you can't go out too far or I find uh, it gets confused. It does. It does, yeah. It does. It also yeah. gets confused on bright stars where you get the diffraction spikes and short exposures because it tries to focus on a bright part of a diffraction spike and it always moves. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I tried to focus on Beetlejuice a few nights ago and I am getting... Never mind. Okay. I was, I was thinking I was about to get Starlinked, but um, no. It's a plane moving next to Sirius, and I thought Sirius was one of the Starlinks flaring at me. Mm. No. That's a nice shot. Yeah. That's a yeah, five, like the framing. five minute sub right there uh, on the propeller. And, like, I tried to center on the propeller, um, but I didn't do a closed loop slew. So that's just, you know, the T point model from two weeks ago holding the polar alignment and the, the, the sky model, and that's where it got me. Um, oh, that's pretty good. But yeah, the, the, the details on that are pretty crisp, um, which is the whole point of having accurate guiding, is it keeps the shadows from getting any light intrusion from nebulosity nearby. So we got 100% zoom. Of course, noise everywhere, but it's a single sub. Yeah, I'm getting a spinny wheel on YouTube right now. I'm oh. just cleared up. Yeah. My uh my remote session is lagging. So we need to talk uh, about getting you a, a good connection out there. <laughs> I, I can help you with that. Next time you're in Dallas, call me. I, I was just there. <laughs> I, I just left there at the end of November actually. Well that's not just like well, to me, it feels like it was just there. Yeah. Like, it's almost April, dude. It's been a third of a year. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It just doesn't seem like it with the pandemic and, you know. No, you're right. So, stars are a little streaked. That could yeah, be... Bit, eh? Are you guiding? You're not guiding, eh? No, I am. On the PhD graph on your SGPs, there's nothing going on. It's not linked. No, it's just running independent in the background. Right. Oh, sure. I don't have a, I don't actually have a. That looks pretty flat to me. Yeah, look, what's that say? A point five two. Uh, it's so you're a little lagged. It's currently point uh, six three. And what's your image scale? Point seven two. Yeah, uh, so you should be okay. Yeah, that doesn't sound bad at all. No, so that might be that might be something optical. It's either optical. Um, I know that my collimation is close, but it's not perfect. But I don't think that's collimation. Um, I think it's. I think it might be a, tilt. A tilt plate as well, right? Yeah, it is, and I, I have a feeling with all this weight that I just put on the way everything shifted, um, yeah. that moonlight is now tilted on that tilt plate a little bit. So I probably um, at this point just need to recollimate. Um, you really don't want to do tonight because it's already nine o'clock and uh oh yeah i do have to get up at like six for work tomorrow but tomorrow night's a clear night so nice. i can mess with collimation and try and try and tighten up those little slightly oblong stars but yeah the, no the guiding is 0.63 so my guiding is less than my pixel scale um But I'll be honest with you, if I were to stack a couple hundred of these and make a really clean photo and my stars look like that, because that's stretched. If I were to go back to the actual data range on the histogram. Yeah, SGP stretch is not amazing. No. I mean, they look pretty pinpoint when you're zoomed out, too. Yeah. So, yeah, stretching it a little bit, they're starting to they're starting to kind of go misshapen. But again, if I drizzle this and do a bunch of dithering in amount of static electricity causing RF interference. All right. Well, he's a, an Aussie Shepherd, right? No, he's a Dachshund. Looks like an Aussie oh, right. Shepherd, but he's a Dachshund. 100% wiener dog. Hi, buddy. Yeah. 
So I will get rid of that and uh, sorry if that gives anybody motion sickness, but there. You'll see in a second. There we go. Oh. Well, hi, yes, you're tired, aren't you? Is that why you keep bothering me? You want me to take you in so we can go to bed? Alright. Well, guys, we have proof of concept. It works. It guides. So, um, I believe I'm going to pack it in for the night. Because I don't have a sequence I want to run. I didn't pick a narrow band target for tonight. Because, honestly, I wasn't even sure that I was going to get a clear night. A few days ago, we were supposed to have clouds through the weekend. And this last storm pulled everything out with it. So... I'll probably spend tomorrow picking a narrow band target for Friday night and a Saturday night. I'll have clear weather. Um, maybe I'll do another live stream. I don't know. Um, but thanks for being on the call. Thanks for sticking around to kind of help out and give me some pointers and, you know, information that you're passing along to me, Michael, is kind of helpful. So. Yeah, I would call uh, success tonight for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I'll let you guys get back to your lives. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get back to mine. All right? All right. Bye. Later.